Well, the who is Professor Kip Thorne, who is absolutely without question one of the leading theoretical physicists of our time. And unusually for a theoretical physicist, he's also a filmmaker. And he's here to tell us about this blockbuster film, Interstellar, and particularly the science behind it. And we have gathered as many people as we can from all over our community on the islands here to share this great excitement about this movie with them. I came because I'm passionate about space and I have my lovely nerd friends who inspired me to come as well. My name is Kip Thorne. I don't know what tie to use for me. Uh, <laughs> Which one, right? Yeah, so I'm, I'm a professor, the I'm the Feynman Professor of Theoretical Physics Emeritus at Caltech. And so that's probably what you want. Behind my house when I was three years old, and the, the apples were all full of wormholes. A hundred years ago, Einstein predicted the existence of gravitational waves, and even he didn't believe we would ever be able to detect them because they're so uh, tiny. And the amazing thing is that we've now finally been able to uh, open up an entire new field of physics by doing this kind of detection. And the way we did it is with an extraordinary machine, really a tour de force of science and technology called LIGO. And we're, uh, at the, we are only at the cusp of what we can discover with this machine. So it's truly an ex uh, exciting time. It's a way for all of the astronomy community to participate in a whole new field. The interesting thing is not proving Einstein right. The interesting thing is that we have done for gravitational waves what Galileo did uh, for electromagnetic waves. Galileo created uh, electromagnetic astronomy when he uh, built a small optical telescope, turned it on the sky and discovered the four moons of Jupiter and looked at the moon, our moon and saw the craters on the moon. Uh, and suddenly you had a tool for probing the universe around you in the way that uh, humans were never able to do before. And that tool has been expanded from optical to uh, radio waves, to x-rays, to gamma rays, ultraviolet, infrared. And uh, all of uh, these are based on electromagnetic oscillations, the same physics. There's only other, one other kind of wave that can propagate across the universe and bring us information about what's far away, and that's the gravitational waves. And gravitational waves are a vibration in space-time, and they're extremely tiny. They're, the result of them is a tiny stretching of a, the order of a ten thousandth of the diameter of a nucleus. So it's basically impossible to detect without the most advanced technology. And, it, and until now, we have never quite believed we would be able to do it. So it's a tribute to the scientists and engineers who worked for decades to get to this point. Small and uh, the external universe is on the exterior. The ring has expanded to cover the entire sky and expanded up overhead and the entire external universe has been squeezed into the... And so we have now opened that tool onto the universe and when you look what uh, has happened with electromagnetic waves in astronomy in the last 400 years since Galileo, a complete revolution in uh, our understanding of the universe. You have to, can't avoid speculating that uh, gravitational waves in the next 400 years are going to bring a similar kind of revolution. And it's already started happening. So the goal was never for us to prove Einstein. It was to create an extremely powerful and radically new tool for exploring aspects of the universe that can't be seen with any, pre uh, any previous kind of instrument. Well, it allows us to see phenomena that we can't detect any other way. For example, the merging of black holes. There's just no uh, electromagnetic or visible signature of those. So it allows us to study aspects of the universe that we've only speculated about. And every time we've had a new field of discovery, we've learned a whole lot of new things about physics. And it's turned everything that we've known on its head. And I expect this will too. I would say the most important aspect of it is this, that uh, when we look back on the period of the Renaissance and we ask what did our ancestors of that period give to us, uh, I think uh, most people would say great music, great art, great architecture, and perhaps they would say also the scientific method that is so important for modern science and technology. Um, and similarly, when our descendants look back on this era, and ask themselves what did we get from the early 21st century, the late 20th century. I think it's going to be 
an understanding of the universe around us and the laws of nature that govern the universe. And that really is what this quest is all about. And that's uh, why we uh, have created gravitational wave astronomy. So it is of enormous cultural importance. Uh, it's not of immediate uh, practical importance, although there are spin-off technologies that are of practical importance, but they were never an important, a significant motivator for this. So I could list spin-off technologies, but uh, that's not the big goal and that's not the big triumph. Uh, but inevitably, when you try to do something that is ha very difficult, and that is far more challenging than technologically than anything anyone has done before, you do develop uh, then technological tools that other people can pick up and use. So black holes, uh, the idea of time warps and, uh, and wormholes, these are all really at the cusp of science and bordering on science fiction, but plausible. And to see those depicted in a movie with a real story about real people, that's great. I really enjoyed seeing that. Now, the unusual thing about Interstellar is that it actually is based on real physics. And so it doesn't use any impossible things, you know, warp drives and, and time travel or anything like that. It's based on things that are rooted in actual current physics. The creativity of, of science and the creativity of movie making come together to really enrich the spirit in this movie. Uh, Anne Hathaway and I talked similarly before she started uh, filming. And she began the conversation by saying to me, now, you know, I'm a bit of a physics can you tell me, is there any observational or experimental evidence as yet about what are the correct laws of quantum gravity? The, the movie sprang from a treatment that I wrote before Christopher Nolan ever came on the project. And so I co-authored a treatment, which is a description of the science in the movie and the story. Uh, to co-author it with Linda Opst, who's a well-known producer in Hollywood. She produced uh, uh, Sleepless in Seattle. Uh, uh, contact with Carl Sagan. Anyway, so, so she and I wrote a treatment and then she brought on the Nolan brothers to write the screenplay and to direct it. They embraced the idea, they were enthusiastic about the idea of beginning from a treatment that was, that in which real science was embedded from the outset and they worked with me brainstorming about the science through the entire project. Uh, almost completely changed the story we began with, but pre preserved the science and together with me injected a, a bunch of new science in. So it's an unusual film in that sense. In film, the principal thing you can do is to inspire uh, the general public and particularly young people about science. Uh, in a ho blockbuster Hollywood movie like Interstellar, uh, you don't have a very good opportunity to explain. There is some explanation in the film, but uh, it has to be somebody who is interested enough to uh, go in and, uh, and uh, watch the movie five times to master the explanations. It's really, the film is primarily inspirational. Uh, there are a number of different genres of science fiction. Our film is what uh, Linda Opes likes to call science faction. That is, it hews close to science fact. So at the very beginning, um, I suggested to Christopher Nolan that uh, uh, guidelines that uh, nothing in the movie would violate well-established physical laws or our knowledge of the universe and all the wild speculations would spring from real science and not just from the imagination of the screenwriter. And uh, he said he was enthusiastic about that as long as it did not get in the way of making a great movie. And if I didn't like what I, he did with the science, I wouldn't have to defend him in public. Uh, I could even criticize him in public. Uh, but uh, I, he was afraid I would play what he called the role of the science police. Uh, but he quickly real found out, as his brother already knew, that uh, I, what I wanted to do was work in a very collaborative way, brainstorming. And uh, when, as it did occur on one occasion, uh, we ran into a situation where uh, trying to stick with the real science got in the way of making a great movie, then he would, would use the artistic license. And that did happen once uh, on the trip through the wormhole. So that's the one place where there was some substantial departure. That's the only place. There are small departures elsewhere, but nothing that uh, uh, of any great significance.
You see this circular ring, which is familiar from the accretion disk, but the external universe is now inside the ring instead of outside the ring. A member of the uh, Physics Nobel Committee telephoned me at 2.15 in the morning, California time, uh, and began by saying it will not surprise you that uh, we're awarding you the Nobel Prize along with uh, Rainer Weiss and Barry Barish. And I responded, it doesn't surprise me at all, but I'm very disappointed because the prize should have gone to the team of a thousand people who pulled this off. And I would have thought that by now, uh, after uh, other experiences of this sort, uh, uh, particularly the discovery of the Higgs boson, that the Nobel Prize Committee would have learned that that's the appropriate way to do it. And he said, well, we have been discussing this issue and we'll be happy to continue the discussion with you in Stockholm. And one of the lessons that should be taught to the general public and that I think is the responsibility of the Nobel uh, Prize Foundation, which they have not taken up, is educating the world about the nature of modern science, that certain things that are really great, which this is, um, that uh, certain things can only be done in a very collaborative way. Uh, and uh, so, but they have not taken up that responsibility. And that was the discussion that we did have uh, when I was in Stockholm. You know, a, a, a several long discussions about that. Well, we want to give back to the public because we recognize that all of our support is based here in the community and from people all around the world. And so this is our way of connecting with the public and, and returning the gift that they have given us to support us in the science.